Good morning. I hope you're, uh, the, the coffee has kicked in, or the tea. J- j- just hands up. I, I know two other people that are here that are interested in cups of tea. A- anyone want to reveal? Okay, it's more than two. I, I see about like seven hands. Okay, I'm trying to build a coalition of interest here. Okay, so I come from the lands of cups of tea. It's five and a half thousand miles from here, and I'm on the east coast of the UK, down there in a little town on the the coast called Felixstowe, which I have to say, normally, at this time of year, is great, because this is my house. Normally, or quite often at this time of the year, I've left my wife in snowdrifts in the freezing cold and come here to enjoy 25 degrees uh, centigrade sunshine. Um, So everyone at home was was mocking me, knowing what I was actually heading into, because the weather actually at home at the moment is very nice, not like this. So anyway, it's still very good to be with you. Um, A quick commercial break before I talk about the little bits that I want to talk about um, during today. First of all, because this has happened since the last official face-to-face time we've actually had a get-together with... um, with VSF. So I just wanted to reiterate that TR09, um, towards the end of last year, parts one and two have been released and just give you, hooray! So I'm just going to give you two quick slides to overview to remind you what they are. So what we looked at um, is the control plane and the data plane, and this is all about going into DMZ, WAN territory for 2110 infrastructure. So we have the control plane. This is the bit that took the time, and we actually we did some testing and prototyping of this with the team and, and iterated it. It's what I can call a constrained NMOS implementation, but it actually gives us that secure demarcation in the control plane to, sh- to share resources. Um, we're, we're pulling some of this into the GCCG work, as John alluded to yesterday, and we actually make use of some of the work that the RISC team have already done as well. So there's lots of synergy there. Also, um, a little plug, um, there's some work here that w- I'm heading up in SIMPTI, but also is actually touching both AMWA and, and VSF in, in the way we're handling this. And this is all about time alignment of essence in production. I think we touched on it again tangentially a little bit yesterday. Um, if you actually have any use cases or are interested in getting involved in this, do, do please contribute. Because of the overlap with some of the work we're doing in GCCG, um, we're, we're, we've, there's a liaison with the VSF from Simpty on this, and because of the need to use some of NMOS tools to actually talk to and from media devices, there's a liaison with AMWA. So it's, it's a tripartite Um, piece of work that's being looked at here. And it's all about fulfilling that gap that I mentioned yesterday in being able to automatically reconcile different media essences as they're actually flowing. If you want to know more details, do please catch me in the break as we go. And final commercial break before I jump into it. Um, At 12.45 today, and um, that's going to be a stretch, so Brad says we're going to come and round everybody up to bring you upstairs and we're going to be finishing for lunch earlier, so you should be able to make this. We've got a great team talking about sustainability in live production. It's a, it's a topic I'm becoming ever more passionate about, and it's something I think it will be really good for us to actually have a collective think about. So I think that's the first time we'll have looked at that during this conference, um, these conferences. So, and we've got a great um, bunch of people from various places across the world that are joining us, either physically or re- virtually, Um, as we actually have this discussion after lunch. So do try and make it back promptly for 12.45. That would be really great. So I want to talk a bit about distributed um, IP production. I want to show you a few user cases briefly that we've actually done as real deployments in the last um, couple of years that actually illustrate different aspects of some of the challenges Um, that we look at. And then I also want, at the end, to look at what is outstanding. What have we got ticks in the box with as an industry? What stuff do we need to actually still keep looking at? So really, um, in that flow in the middle there, on one of my little pictures I use here, we're talking about the acquisition and presentation and the actual, the processing, be that on compute or be that in, in traditional appliance. This is a picture that I've been using, I think, since last autumn. And it, I call it the three Ps. And I think the differentiation between 
Um, what we're now doing in all of the use cases I want to just very briefly go through this morning compared with previously is we're actually using IP transformation to actually make use of the sharing of people, processing and places. So we're actually in the phase now and probably have been for the last couple of years where we're really leveraging the advantage of the flexibility of IP to actually make workflow changes and change the way we work things rather than just swapping out SDI technology for IP technology, which itself has some benefits, but it's certainly not the be-all and end-all. So the three Ps, bear these in mind as we actually transition into these, these next diagrams. And again, I know you've seen this diagram before, or certainly the left-hand side of it. This is a DPP models for remote production or distributed production, as I call it. Um, on the left, these are basically looking at defining the acquisition location, the storage and processing location, and the control location. And the different models, so the traditional studio is the top left one where everything is co-located. And then we've got, as it's fairly obvious from that diagram, the different models of where you have the control, where you have the processing and storage, and where you actually have the acquisition of the content. And the DPP, um, I was involved in the brainstorming of that on the left-hand side, came up with those five models. We've kind of added three more that I've come across in the way actual real-world implementations have been done. So it's a useful reference, and it illustrates, again, those three, P, those three Ps, the flexibility of these different architectures as we move forward. So this is what I call the kind of evolution we're on in, in, in production. So I've, I've alluded to those first couple of phases. I think most of us are kind of now in that green phase, the third phase here, um, complete IP end-to-end. -end. So we have that three Ps, sharing of resources, people, processing. We've got that flexibility. Um, and obviously all of the other uh, things that go with, you know, standard with, with the IP infrastructure. And what we're urging to is that kind of purple block on the end where we're moving more towards OPEX models, we're moving more to integrate NLE tools in live, and I'll come on to that shortly, um, and uh, that, that true convergence of those in, all of those endpoints. So, so that's where we are, green heading into purple on the right-hand side, if you look at um, the flexibility that we're moving with production. So... This is just a reference point. This is uh, another picture I've been using for a while. Just to remind you of the different elements, I just want to say thank you to the guys for the, um, especially Kira and first thing for talking about the 5G infrastructure. We've done quite a few tests in the last 18 months with 5G integrated into production. And I think there are, the, the, it really is actually starting to get traction now, especially with NPN technology. Um, so that's actually a real, a real plus. I think that some of the work that's outstanding, which again, Kieran alluded to earlier, like um, timing, how we actually get timing, because when we, if we want to fully integrate microphones and cameras on a 5G connectivity into a production system, we do need those sampling points and the timestamps to have the same accuracy and resolution and be interchangeable with standard you know, connected triax cameras, etc. Um, 2110 direct cameras. So, so some of that is still in the future on 5G, but we're actually seeing a lot of progress there as well. One piece of technology that I think has transformed from the deployments that um, I've been privy to in the last couple of years um, is this element of doing control federation. On the right-hand side, um, I talk about the requirements, and this came into the TR09 work when we were brainstorming it, that was the key user requirements, it, you know, full autonomy. So this is for any given location. So this is on a campus, in a truck, wherever you are. Full autonomy, um, full resilience, um, yet, and almost in, in contra to those two, um, full sharing. So people are looking to have their infrastructure um, resilient, reliable and secure, yet do that sharing. And the work that we've done in TR09 leads, leads a long way to that. We've also done, in, in parallel with that and in advance of that, quite a lot of work on control plane federation uh, ourselves internally, 
um, ahead of in embrace, fully embracing TR09. Um, but that's actually been a key enabler. I want to go through in these mini case studies now, or micro case studies, 90 seconds each or something, um, just talk about how these have actually provided benefit. Also say, same picture, but talking about cloud. So the concept of federating and sharing resources in this kind of divide and conquer environment is actually very useful also with cloud infrastructure. And that applies equally as well in the control and orchestration of cloud infrastructure and resources as it does um, traditional terrestrial connectivity and resources. Okay, a few ultra brief examples just to talk you through. I've got six examples of different deployments in different places that use some of those different DPP models that we've talked about and use some of those um, federation and some of the other techniques. Then I'll come on to some of the challenges after that. So this case is a, is a pan-European deployment. It's discovery. Um, I know other people in the room that have had some involvement in this as well. The, interestingly, since there's been some further acquisitions that Warner um, Discovery have, have done, this has actually grown even more. So this is, a, this is a network that's actually being expanded at the moment. I think my claim in bold diagonal letters there is, is, is valid. The, I think the latest scale is there are 200,000 NMOS endpoints in the network. Um, so I can remember in some infrastructure we were deploying four or five years ago where 10,000 was a stretch target and we're now 200,000 and increasing in, in, in the scale of this network. So it's a private cloud production model on their bottom there to refer back to the DPP model. Two um, massive data centers, um, one in the UK and one in the Netherlands, and then many, many different countries that are actually using that um, to actually connect into. And in terms of the federation, we've actually got two different um, fully resilient, secure control systems, one in each of those centers, one in the UK and one in the Netherlands. And there's actually further look at federating and fragmenting and federating to a, a greater degree to provide even more resilience and flexibility. So that's a use case where we're actually using compression, JPEG XS, in the interconnect internationally, but linear uncompressed in country. So key, key case there and scalability is, is, is a key thing there. Follow the Sun production is number two case study. Um, this was alluded to a bit um, at a presentation that we had last June here um, by the guys from Riot Games. Um, this is their, their vision to actually have three eight hour offset production centers around the world in which they're doing um, effectively that follow the sun production. So it's all about having flexible connectivity to actually bring in and be able to produce the events from there. So it's that centralized production model down the bottom there. So you've got acquisition in one location, in the various locations, and then you've got the control and processing in these follow the sun centers. So that's case study number two. Case study number three, this is another European one. Um, this is an interesting one because it started off on the right-hand side as a single IP facility, so a single campus solution um, with traditional infrastructure. And again, I know some other people in the, in the room were, have been involved in providing some, some elements of this. So orchestration and control for an individual campus. And then what we've ended up doing as that's grown to a national infrastructure is provide connectivity and that's actually being provided um, to actually interconnect. So we actually have orchestration and SDN control of a WAN environment as well as multiple infrastructures um, separately federated controlling different individual campus locations. So it's that element that I was talking about earlier where we actually have full autonomous autonomy and security and resilience of infrastructures, and then we have the federation of those together. So that's actually another, uh, another solution that's actually running live. This is an interesting one. Um, this is relatively a, a, very, a very new solution. Um, and this was a just wanted to illustrate another use of federation. So this is a, what I would call a traditional on-location standard infrastructure where both the acquisition, the processing, and the control is co-located on a campus. But actually, 
um, one of the things that this customer was looking to do was actually have as much autonomy resilience and resilience and security within their studios and control rooms and their player infrastructure and their MCR areas. So we actually ended up doing different control systems um, for each of those areas and federating those together. So that secure resource sharing is happening, but you've got even more segregation and resilience of the different elements. So this is nothing to do with going over wild connectivity in wide area networks or being interconnecting with com competition or other entities. This is within an organization. So a, di a different use case that there. Case study five. So this is an, another interesting one that's um, very recently happened um, at the very end of last year. Um, I call it multi-organization federation. So there's a, a broadcaster in Scandinavia that was looking to actually... Again, this is leveraging those three Ps, the, the, the people, the processing, and the places. Um, multiple sports events, and it's all about scaling up. Scaling up when they've got peak demand. So they could handle some of the infrastructure production themselves, this broadcaster at their core center, but they don't have anywhere near the infrastructure to actually do the production for all the simultaneous events, sports events that happen at certain occasions. So what they did was they had liaisons or contracts with other production companies. I call them here production company A and B. Um, so that in scaling up using this federation concept, they can actually enable different other production companies to basically pop in virtually and actually offer the, the control and processing elements of that distributed production as part of this. And I've got a, a different diagram just to show that conceptually with those different models. So we've effectively got the production companies that are doing the control and processing remote from the acquisition. And then we've got also the TV studio, which is doing effectively that same remote processing and control as well as their own acquisition points. So we've got two different DPP models there in use in the same solution. But again, this is actually demonstrating the benefits of this, the flexibility of IP in terms of the resource sharing that's actually happening and going on there. And my final micro case study is, is, is a radio one. We must never forget the audio. It is actually the most important element. Um, and this is, a, um, this is a production model where the acquisition and the um, control is in one location, then there's centralized processing. So this is a national radio infrastructure. But again, very similar con principles in terms of the way the control's working and the way that this distributed production is working, but using centralized processing for, um, for multiple locations, 50, 50 different studios in different locations. So those illustrate several of the points that I wanted to talk about. Also, moving forwards, and this is touching again on some of where we were going a little bit in the discussion that we were having yesterday afternoon in the GCCG work, the, the broadcast soft end game, this is a diagram I, I, I think I showed in the, in the full meeting that we had of VSF. Um, this, is, this is where I believe we're heading. So the, the non-negotiables, again, which were articulated to some degree yesterday, the, the acquisition is a real-time process, the consumption is a real-time process. And therefore, by very nature of human beings being involved, the production, the sound booth, the gallery, is, um, needs to have those video and audio feeds in real time. But through the rest of the process, every, everything else, as long as we actually have the timing information, the acquisition timing information propagating what we're doing, the, the system that's processing needs to be time aware in manipulating that information and in terms of budgeting the time it takes to execute, but it doesn't need to be linear real time. And I had an interesting discussion with Richard after, after the session yesterday when we were just talking about, and for some reason, oh, I'm pressing the wrong button, that's why. Some of the mindset that um, John and I and, and, uh, were, were talking about yesterday was the concept of, what we've done in GCCG so far is looked at going to and from the cloud in what I call linear world. So traditional linear 2110 or any other linear 
connectivity format. And then we're thinking about the non-linear connectivity as being the preserve of the compute. And again, when we talk about intra-cloud, um, by here I mean software processing and compute rather than specifically public cloud or anything else. So, but interestingly, everything else at the moment in the mindset of the way we've been articulating this is linear. And Richard challenged me yesterday afternoon as we were talking about this and saying, well, actually, do we, you know, at what point do we actually become non-linear? Do we actually throw away the traditional linear connection that we've enjoyed in STI and 2022-6 and 2110 essences. And there is no reason why that couldn't be right from the camera, even to the, the device that actually people are consuming on. So I think where we're starting to head within compute now could actually propagate and ripple right from camera handoff right to reconstruction in end device, depending on you know, how that works for content producers. So just reflecting that back into this diagram. Now, the other area that's interesting, and this is a, a picture from my parent company, which I stole, um, so you can't see it too well on here, but one of, one, of the, one of the stories here, or one of the concepts here, is looking at what they traditionally have called cloud, which is inherently, traditionally, non-linear processing functions in cloud, um, and looking at how that converges with the traditional on-premise uh, or real-time processing that's been done. And that's an interesting concept, and I think we're, we're heading this more and more. So what we're seeing at the moment is, if you look along that view at the bottom there, there's several of these processes are being realized virtually now. So, you know, the, the ISO in, in, ingest into the cloud, the ISO recording functions happening, um, vision switches happening, instantiated, certainly for lower T productions that are working well in cloud. Audio mix again, multi-viewers um, being, being instantiated in the cloud and working now very effectively, uh, and along with everything that for the direct-to-home element, the, the encode. All of those elements are, are now actually maturing in cloud deployment or soft deployment in general. We're actually seeing some you know, the, the, the graphics has been very well um, software-based for a long time. We've got some very good um, software-based replay solutions that are coming to the market now that are entirely, um, entirely cloud-based. But those bits at the top that I talk about, you've probably seen some, um, some demos of some of these happening, like automatic clipping using AI or ML tech tools to create highlights in flight that human beings don't even have to be involved in, apart from maybe a few pieces of meta metadata to trigger. Um, auto TDs, if you like, auto cutting of a production um, done by image analysis. There's some great demos that have been shown there. All of these, then there's the, all the traditional augmented and virtual reality elements. And then if you've got like, if you're subscanning an 8K image to do an auto PTZ environment where you're tracking virtually within a large image to create that, all of those tools are now, as compute gets there, becoming the preserve of something that can actually be fully integrated into a real-time soft-based production. So this is exciting because we're actually seeing the convergence of what have been traditionally quite a lot of these offline NLE tools now actually be able to become part of a mainstay live production. So this is the, the real-time and non-real-time convergence that's being enabled by the virtualization and the computization of, of, of the real-time chain that we're actually looking at and we're seeing. A quick appeal. I mentioned this very, very briefly at the, in, in, in a question at the autumn, uh, um, sorry, fall session that we had for VidTrans, um, for VSF. Um, there's, there's a piece of work I'm trying to kick off and I'd love some feedback um, if, if you're able to give it to me um, on, on how, how to, what, what we should do here. So we, we have acquisition. So um, the, the acquisition location that I've shown you on many other slides, we have the cameras, the microphones, we have the tally, we have the talk back, we have the auto queue, all of those elements that are sitting there. Tradition, if we think about our distributed architecture, we have processing in a different location, potentially control in a different location, and monitoring needed in various locations. 
what I'm trying to build up is a picture of actually what is the maximum tolerable latency of the interconnect of all of these different bits. Because as we do latency optimization in compute infrastructure, and as we further optimize latency in 2110 infrastructure, which I'm going to mention very briefly in a second, this is very important to actually understand what is tolerable. Now, there are a few principles I've already had in feedback. I've had some figures from various broadcasters and comments like, it doesn't matter quite, it doesn't matter quite so much to some degree what the value is as long as it's constant. Um, but if anyone is interested in contributing any figures to help me build this up, that would be really appreciated. One quick comment. Um, on 2110 accumulated latency. This is something I think as an industry we really need to work to. At the moment, we're in a situation where, as I think I'm right in saying, for instance, every big switch vendor that I know, vision mixer vendor, um, used to have a nice two line of SDI delay in their, in their system. And now we've gone to 2110, everyone gives a whole frame of latency. So we've actually gone from two lines to one frame because everyone is scared of an offset other than TR offset zero in the way TR, TR um, 2110 is implemented. So if anyone wants to think about or get in, involved in discussing how we can actually create and get people comfortable with offsets at a non-integer frame to actually minimize accumulated latency in 2110, I'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, conclusions, I'm not going to actually talk through these because I think I've just about hit time, but just wanted to say, you know, we've, we've actually got some really, we've made some great progress as an industry and as vendors in attacking a lot of the stuff we need to for distributed production. There are still several elements that I've got there, uh, largely latency driven um, or, or timing driven that I think are still things we need to work on. And a subtle plug for the sustainability discussion later on as well. But we're still on an exciting journey. We've got, um, we've got lots of stuff, I think, still to, to fix and to get sorted out to give the ultimate capability to the content creators that want to use this stuff. So thank you very much. And I'd like to remind you, if you get to the UK, there's a cup of tea available for you. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you.